Hello my friends and welcome once more to another Red Gaming Tech video of myself and Marta where I'm going to be covering the latest news from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours. We're going to kick off today's proceedings with some sour news for Intel. Obviously their 14nm supply issues are well documented and they're not easing up as soon as they hoped. They are now saying that they're going to be continuing and obviously people like Dell and other companies have not exactly been shy about being honest about the impact this has had on their companies as well because obviously they can't supply the products because Intel can't give them the product. Makes perfect sense. So what we have is an article on finance.yahoo.com I just want to thank Matthew for sending this in to us. Um, if you have any links or things that you might find interesting for us to cover, you can message them as well on social media, or we have an email address as well, contact at raidgamingtech.com. Anywho, so what do we have? We have comments from the Dell CFO, Tom Sweet, that basically said that they are, quote, evaluating AMD chips when he was asked how the company is actually going to address the ongoing chips shortage from Intel. And this is hardly surprising when you remember that they're not expecting these supply issues to abate until the second half of next year at the earliest, at the earliest. So we could even be still talking about these supply issues next December, you know, December 2020. Let's see if I am. Unfortunately, I have my crystal, crystal ball on me at the moment, but uh, we'll see in a year's time. So Dell's quarter were 6% uh, and 16% sales decline in consumer PC and servers respectively and PCs obviously were held back by a lack of Intel chip supply. The server weakness was a bigger issue but obviously Intel, um, Dell sorry, isn't exactly happy that this is going to be continuing until question mark in 2020. So while they're not saying that they're jumping into bed with AMD tonight, you know, they're going to be making a new Ryzen powered laptops or whatever, they are at least considering it because, well, they would recover faster from this if they looked for another source. We'll have to see how this one turns out, of course. They may decide after evaluation to remain with Intel because they have gotten their processors from Intel for 35 years. That's not the sort of relationship you want to sour quickly, of course. So let's wait and see, but uh, interesting that they're even considering working with AMD. And speaking of AMD, we've got a couple of things from them today, the first of which is regarding the RX 5300M. So what we actually have is that, well, the first benchmarks for this particular GPU, which of course is a entry-level mobility graphics chip, have been unveiled by Notebook Check. So basically, they were given some benchmarks for an early pre-production notebook equipped with the 5300M. So we have a few benchmarks to get through here, but before we get into the actual results, it's important to remember that Apple does have an exclusive Pro variant of this card with 128-bit memory bus and 4 gigabytes of VRAM. The rest of us have to make do with a slightly cut down version, 96-bit bus and 3 gigabytes of VRAM. Just tuck that in your hat for um, future reference. So the sample that they were given was clocked at 1036 MHz base and 1445 MHz boost. Now the base clock is actually lower than the default of 1181. The reasons for that, it could be any number of reasons. This is a pre-production uh, machine that this was benchmarked on, so it could just be due to battery concerns. It could be due to any, numerous, uh, any number of things, sorry, should I say. So let's talk about the first result, which is 3D Mark at 1080p, and this is Fire Strike uh, that we see benchmarked here. So we see a score of 8,782 points. And as you can see, that is scoring just ahead of the 1650 and quite a bit below that of the 1660 Ti Max-Q variant. Now, we should be pretty damn impressed with this result, to be honest, because the 1650, just to remind you, does have higher clock speeds and more memory than that of the 5300M. We do have more benchmarks to get through, and they do give us a more complete picture than just the one, so let's move swiftly on to our next one. We see um, Fire Strike graphics score here. So for the 5300M, we do see 10,306 points. Um, we do see that, again, ahead of the 1650, which scored 9,315, again, 
and behind the 1660 tie, which scored 13,362. But we do have, again, more benchmarks. We've got 3D Mark 11 next, this time at 720p. And as you can see the results on screen, we do see a score of 11,869 for the 5300M. Once again, ever so slightly, and I do mean ever so slightly ahead of the 1650 here, a difference of about 30-ish points. My maths is terrible, and I'm not going to try and do it on video, so roughly something along those lines. But again... Training behind another 55M machine, the MSI Alpha, which has been the case across all of these benchmarks, and of course behind the 1660 tie as well. So 3D Mark 11, once again 720p performance GPU, and we see 14265 points for the 5300M. Uh, training once again behind the MSI Alpha variant and ahead of the 1650, which had 13228, and again significantly behind that of the 1660 tie. Now obviously it is a bit closer between the MSI Alpha variant and the 1660 Type, but we do still see a lead there for the NVIDIA GPU. So while we have a nice sort of suite of benchmarks being done here, this is still one sort of variant of benchmarks I guess you could say because it is still 3D Mark. Um, we should wait and see a more complete picture before you know making any real decisions, but it is still very impressive that the six, um, sorry, the 5300M manages to beat out the 1650 in pretty much all of, not in all of these cases, pretty much all of these cases. And obviously we can see there's a more powerful variant as well, the MSI Alpha 15 kicking around. So I wanna see more benchmarks, of course, I'm sure you guys do as well, gaming and so on and so forth, but still nice results here from the 5300M. But let's move on to our next AMD topic, which is regarding the X670. And this one is actually rather interesting. It's regarding the X670. Now, obviously, at present, the X570 is produced in-house over at AMD. That wasn't actually the case previous generation. We did see series chipsets being produced by a third party. And it seems that the X670 is actually going to be a return to that arrangement, according to a report from My Drivers. And you can find their article linked in the description below this video, but you will have to get your Google Translate on. Now, who is this going to be? Who knows? I mean, it it could be as media because they did produce the 300 series and 400 series chipsets. So it would kind of make sense for them to go back to them. But that's a safe guesstimate. But I don't actually know, of course, and the report doesn't actually say just that they are claiming that they're returning to a third party production for this. But let's move on from AMD, shall we, to some potentially bad news for us as consumers regarding DRAM. So, according to a report from Tom'sHardware.com, and of course you can find their link in the description below this video, analysts are basically saying that they are expecting a 30% increase in memory pricing over the next year. Now, the first, or one of the better reports, I suppose you should say, as Tom points out, um, regarding this, is about five weeks old, but... Other analysts have kind of chimed in going, yeah, we think we're actually due for a bit of a turnaround here. Of course, memory prices have just been crazy low because, well, there's just been way too much supply and not enough demand. And we have definitely seen the effects in various companies. Of course, this is just an, an, an analyst's prediction that we're going to be seeing this. We'll have to wait and see, unfortunately, how true this ends up being, but... Seems the time might be running out on getting yourself some cheap memory if perhaps you are waiting out on that. But let's move on to our final topic of today's video and it's Qualcomm who are just continuing to have a bad time. So I want you guys to do me a favour, okay? I want you to cast your minds back to 2016 when the South Korean Free Trade Commission fined Qualcomm $854 million for violating competition laws. And Qualcomm turned around and appealed the decision to the Seoul High Court. And here we are, three years later, and the court has made a decision. And unsurprisingly, they have actually upheld the FTC in Korea's decision to fine the company, once again, a very hefty sum, $876 million. But it actually goes a bit further than that, as the court even agreed with the FTC's assessment that Qualcomm acts discriminatory against companies that wish to use its essential patents for developing competing modem solutions. So, according to the KFTC, Qualcomm violates business code of conduct by, quote, establishing a business model that's not licensed at a chipset level, and the said licenses at a handset level. Qualcomm achieves this through refusing to license or imposing restrictions on the license for SEPs, which is standard essential patents, to competing uh, chipset companies. 
Linking the chipset supply with patent license agreements, Qualcomm has coerced the execution and performance of unfair license agreements by using its chipset supply as leverage while circumventing FRAND commitments. And then, providing handset companies with only comprehensive portfolio licenses and coerce unilaterally determined royalty terms without conducting a procedure to calculate fair compensation or demanding handset companies to cross-license their patents for free. Ouch. So, this decision has been upheld. Unsurprisingly, Qualcomm, they're not just going to take that. They have one more thing that they can do. They're going to be appealing against the South Korean Supreme Court. Now, given it took us three years to get to this point after the 26th ruling, it's probably going to be quite a while before we get any resolution to this, especially considering it involves the Supreme Court of South Korea. So, going to be interesting to see how this turns out for the company because, well, Qualcomm are being sued not just in this one country, just to remind you. And while they have a lot of money, like go and Google how much they're actually worth and their income and all this, it's insane. But this is still almost a billion dollars. You know, while they're not exactly going to go bankrupt from this, they're not exactly going to be happy about handing over this amount of cash because, well, why else would they be fighting so hard about, uh, to, sorry, to, to not pay it? And it's, again, it's just a lot of money for any company, regardless of the size. So, so it's going to be interesting to see if the Supreme Court upholds this. Anyway, that is me done for this video. Thank you so much for watching. As always, your support is highly appreciated. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.